All right. Well, welcome everyone again. We have been for the last several weeks talking about the topic of work, and I've been, I've been, I'll tell you, I've just been fascinated over and over again to discover how much the Bible says about something that, like, we think so much about our work, like whatever that is, from a career to raising a family to just managing life and your schedule. It's fascinating to me when you read the Bible that. Uh, you and I were designed to do that. You and I were created in the image of a sustainer, a creator God, which means that you and I were all hardwired to be like God in a way, to create, to build things, and to sustain. And it's funny, I, I was thinking about this a little bit this week, and it just, it jumped out at me. Even when you read something like the Ten Commandments, right? There's this command about the Sabbath, and you, you, you read it in the Bible and go, this is about the Sabbath, that you're supposed to rest, and like you talk about work-life balance and how healthy that is. But it just hit me again this week, like when you read the command about the Sabbath, do you know what the command actually says? Fascinating. Uh, I'll just, I'll read it for you. Uh, this is the command about the Sabbath, right? It, it should be on the screen, Exodus 20 verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. Like the, the command about Sabbath is like most words are about working, right? Amazing. Anyway, work isn't a bad thing, we learned. Work is a God thing because that's what we're supposed to do. And uh, I, I don't get a lot of feedback after message. I think people just want to get coffee, so they usually shake my hand. But there are a couple messages where I said something like that, that God has a plan for your work or you're designed to work. And uh, I got two fairly big objections to these ideas. And the first one, it, it, it's, it's real. A couple of you said this, actually. Uh, you said something like, okay, fine, sure. Uh, maybe God designed me to be productive, but my work is terrible. And let me tell you, and you told me about your boss or about the insurance company that you're constantly on hold with, or some of you are like, uh, look, I, I love these kids, but it's work, and it's a war zone down there, so uh, let me just talk to you for longer, because I don't want to go downstairs and find my kids. <laughs> like, this is a big problem, right? Frustration with work is something that we need to talk about, and we're going to talk about that next week. Because the second thing you all said was, sure, God may have designed me for work, but uh, work is a lot of things. How do I possibly know what my work is supposed to be. And does God actually care about like whatever work I'm doing? Because I'm not even sure if I care about my work sometimes. That's what we're going to talk about today. And this might be really big. This is one of these topics, a question that might actually change the trajectory of some lives. Because we've got kids, right? Some of you are... Uh, Actually, I laugh at high school kids. Some of you are going to get annoyed over the holidays because everyone's going to ask you, so what are you going to major in in college? And you're like, I don't want to talk to you right now, right? Because it's a big decision. Or you might be a college student and you're trying to figure out what's my job going to be. It can't be just going to school. Or you might be at the stage of life where you're transitioning or thinking about retirement. Or maybe you just have people around you who you love, kids, friends who... They're trying to figure out the right fit in life, but that's a big, big thing. How do you know what to do with your life? And what, what you know is because God makes everybody different, and uh, there's a lot of like, different sorts of gifts and hum uh, personality sites. Everyone kind of fits in a different place. So let me, let me just start here. Here's what you sang about. God is everywhere. And the Bible teaches, and we'll look at this, no matter where you end up, with, with a couple exceptions, like don't, don't come, come to me at the door and say, so I think God's calling me to be a criminal mastermind. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. Like most places where you end up, God calls and empowers. This is amazing about God. He leads and shepherds people in lots of different places, which is why if you just start off here saying, I'm going to trust and follow this God who's bigger than I am, you'll probably end up in the right place, whatever that looks like. Let me give you an example. Uh, think about the story of Beziel and Aholio. You guys aren't thinking about this. What's, what's going on? It's going to be really hard. Um, not, not the most famous story in the Bible, maybe not even uh, 2019's most popular baby names, 
But let me tell you the story. It's in Exodus 31. Uh, the Lord says to Moses, See, I have called by name Beziel, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. And you're like, whoa, what sort of like big job does this person have? Uh, and here's what his job is. He devises artistic designs. He works with gold, silver, bronze. He cuts stones. He carves woods to work in every craft. Uh, and he says, oh, also, and behold, I've appointed with him a Holyab, and I have given to, see what it says, all able men ability that they might make all I have commanded you. You know what this story is about? It's about some normal guys who work with their hands, who design things. Men who would have been easily overlooked because they're not doing what Moses is doing. But sometimes the things that we overlook, God looks at carefully. Like, look at what hap what's happening in this story. It's about ordinary craftsmen with ordinary normal jobs. Like, think about what's happening here. I mean, the first thing, and this is just how life works. People around them notice that they happen to be good at stuff. That happens, right? Here's a guy who knows how to work with tools. He knows how to cut things. He's got a good eye for design, and everybody knows it. Like, this is just how it works. Like, you notice, or I would say people around you can tell if you're good at things. Like, I, sometimes I'll hear, I hear myself saying, hey, I can make things out of woods. I could do sheetrock. And other people around me are like, no, you can't. Like, I, I've seen you try, uh, stick to a preaching or something. Like, thanks, guys, by the way. That's, that's really helpful. Um, <laughs> the, the second thing we notice here uh, is really specific details here, right? Like, God, God cares about how people are cutting rocks. God notices craftsmanship. I mean, here's God who cares and notices how people who work with their hands, building beautiful things, God loves the details, which means that when you're working at something, God notices when you do something over the right way. God notices what people see. But here's the thing that people can't see, the thing that's going on behind the scenes. For in this story, what's going on behind the scenes of these talented craftsmen, God says that he has supernaturally empowered and gifted people. You see the language here? God calls. God gave able people ability, is what the Bible says, which becomes a window into how God works in ordinary jobs that we just see as normal. I mean, this is something about God that we don't talk about enough, probably. All of our lives, all of our vocational callings, your, your stage of life, what you do, it's all somehow woven into a beautiful tapestry of God's often hard to understand, hard to see, this thing that we call providence. Here's what we don't see most of the time. God's got something going on, even if you can't see it. Someone made this insightful observation. I think it's in your notes. Uh, here's what God does for each of us. God calls you to the kind of work that you need most to do and that the world most needs to have done. And the place that God calls you is a place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Let me tell you just how big our God is. God is big enough to cross industry lines. He's not like stuck in a church world. He has the world world in his hands in ways that most people can't see. Like, like check out these verses, right? This is, this is a little bit deep, but just, I mean, hang on, just going to be a payoff. This is Romans uh, 2 verse 14. The Apostle Paul writes, hang on, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, sometimes accusing them 
and at other times even defending them. This is a complicated verse. It's not really stated that simply, but uh, what it was saying is it's pretty simple, that people who don't read the Bible, they still, without even seeing it, God influences them, which means, do you know where God works? God works everywhere, in everybody, because people has, have consciences. People who don't believe in God have a sense of justice. People, no matter how hard they try and deny it, like everybody who's human knows there's a God somehow, and that he must be bigger than we are, and that we must have to take him seriously, and that he's got to make some demands on us. Or, or here's another verse. Check out this one. This one's another really long verse. I'm sorry. It's a uh, this one's fascinating, though. Uh, hang on. This is Isaiah 28, verse 24. You might have to look this up. Isaiah writes, When a farmer plows for planting, and then there's a question, does he plow continually? I have no idea. Does he keep on breaking up and working the soil when he's leveled the surface? Does he not sow carowell and scatter cumin? I don't know. Um, does he not plant wheat in its place? Barley in its plot and smelt in its field. This is his God, Isaiah says, instructs him and teaches him in the right way. Caraway is not threshed with a, a sledge, nor does a wheel of a cart uh, thresh cumin. Uh, grain is ground with, into, uh, I lost my place. Grain must be ground to make bread, so one does not go on threshing it together. The wheels of a threshing cart may be rolled over, but one does not use horses to grind grain. And here's the interesting part. All this stuff that I lost track of comes from the Lord Almighty, whose plan is wonderful, whose wisdom is magnificent. Do you guys know what this is talking about? We're in trouble. I have no idea. <laughs> like, this is uh, a lot of details about ancient farming, right? Do farmers plow continually? Where do you plant cumin? Like, I, I have literally no idea where to sow seeds. And to be honest, uh, I'm not even sure how to make bread or how to use horses. In fact, if, if you come up to me afterwards and ask me any questions about this, you know what, you know what I'm going to do? Like, how did ancient farmers know how to farm? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You can ask me if you want. I'm going to look it up in a science book, or I, I'll probably ask Google, right? Uh, but God, like, the, the end of the verse, it, it makes this amazing claim. Isaiah says all this scientific detail. Isaiah says anyone who becomes a skillful farmer or, or learns all the details of successfully growing food Isaiah says, when you learn how, how all that stuff works, Isaiah says all of that comes from who? The Lord. Uh, Tim Keller argues that every other advancement in learning every work of art, every innovation in healthcare or technology or management, it's all just God opening up his book of creation and revealing what the world is like to us. Like, Google may be a search engine, and it might very well find God's answers. But Isaiah claims when you learn how the world works, no matter how you think you do it, somehow you're learning more about the one who made it. When you learn how to cut a tree and make it land in the right spot, which I can't do, really what you're doing is you're, you're learning how God made trees. When you learn about how math works, or how to make ice cream, or how to navigate really complicated spreadsheet, you are learning about how God orders the world that he made. When you work at creating and maintaining, do, do you know what you're doing? You are somehow working in God's world using tools that God gives to you, which is, which is what Isaiah says is happening. I mean, God is giving it all to us. Or think about this verse. This is James 1 verse 17. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of heavenly lights. You know what that means? I mean, think about this. Every act of goodness, wisdom, justice, beauty, like no matter where you think it comes from, no matter where it looks like it's coming from, it's, it's a gift from God. 
And there are lots of verses that talk about this. Some of them just like, will blow your mind if you think about it. I, Isaiah 45 verse 1 talks about Cyrus, a pagan king, and God gives this enemy of God the spirit and uses Cyrus to lead the world. You read the story and scratch your head and go, wow. Or uh, Genesis 20 verse 6, you can read the story. God works in another pagan king, a, a bad guy. It, God works in government, which is, which, wow, amazing, right? If God does that, God can work anywhere. Or um, in my previous church, I, I got to lead an adult Sunday school class. It was really fun. And uh, I, I just ranted for a long time about Isaiah, but one of, one of the guys who started coming was a guy, he introduced himself, his name is Ray Demadian, and he just joined a small group. It was actually set up almost exactly like the one we have here, right after church in the fireside room. And we were talking about Isaiah, a passage like this, and he just said a lot of stuff. He didn't know that much about Isaiah, but he made a comment like, yeah, I, I get it. I know what this verse is talking about. He said, when I invent things, he said, I do what God wants me to do. And he said, I think science is my way of studying God. And I was like, okay, sure. Like, that's weird. Uh, so later on, like, I mean, how many people do I know who said, when I invent stuff, I? So I, I Googled him, <laughs> like what everyone does. And I, I didn't know this about him, but I discovered that this uh, mediocre student in my science school class was the inventor of the MRI machine. <laughs> And I Googled him, and there's pictures of him, like, in the early 70s with, like, copper wire, wires wrapped around himself in his basement. And uh, he popped up in medical history books. And uh, I, I, the guy was in my class, and he, he invented the MRI. And later on, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> you, you, you missed out on getting a Nobel Peace Prize. Like, this is amazing. What was it like, I asked him, to invent this thing that helped so many people? And that day, he taught the class, <laughs> and he walked through the history of medical discovery, and he, he talks about hospitals and inventions, and he, he, he is actually still annoyed that he didn't get a Nobel Prize, but, I mean, I am too, but I, I don't have any good reasons to be upset about it. Um, but, but I'll never forget what he said next, because I, I got a window into the world of really good scientists. He said, all of the best scientists, he said, saw what they were doing as worship. And he said, when, when I was trying to work as hard as I was at even all the, the details of discovering something as complicated as magnetic imaging, he said, I was, I was learning about God, he said. And I won't forget that. Because it's a big point that he learned that maybe would help all of us. No matter what you're doing in God's world, you are surrounded by God's gifts, which means you have opportunities everywhere you go, no matter where you end up, what your work looks like. You have the chance to learn more about God and the chance to live out your image of making, building, and maintaining life. Still leaves the question, of course, if God's creation is all God's work, if the whole world is in God's hand, if he gifts people everywhere, uh, where should I be, <laughs> right? Or if you've got kids or friends who are trying to pick majors or careers or transitioning, if you're looking for another job, uh, what am I supposed to do to, to help me figure out where I fit? Big topic, obviously. I, I'm not going to answer everything. But let me, I, I just don't want you to leave without having a couple helpful questions to ask. Here are four questions to ask yourself to maybe even help other people you might know going through the process of where they might belong. First question, this is big. How has God wired and designed you? I mean, God makes everybody different, right? From birth, right? Lots of stories in the Bible about this. Take, you can look up the past in Jeremiah 1.5 if you want. But Jeremiah, uh, here's God saying, before you were born, I had a job for you. And some people are just born like they're toddlers and they're wired to do stuff. Or King David, Psalm 139, just marvels about God. Like, God, you formed me in my mother's womb to do what I do. And there's something about, and there's certainly broken parts of us that are affected by, like lots of us, I mean all of us, have broken wiring in some ways. But you can figure out what someone should be doing based on how they're wired. There, there's things you're good at, things you're bad at. 
And uh, the people around you probably know what those things are. There's certain, like for me, there's certain things I'm good at and there's certain things I'm bad at. And I figure that out by doing it. Like my, my first job ever, I was uh, 14 years old and I got a job working as a house painter. There's a guy at our church, he was bragging, I guess, that he hired anybody. He, uh, he saw a service of ministry, he would uh, employ convicts and teach them how to paint right out of prison. They, they, they couldn't do anything. And my dad heard, oh, you hire people who don't know how to do anything. Uh, how about my 14-year-old son? So uh, I, I, I loved working with convicts. It was great. And uh, I heard some really fun stories. And uh, I was the fastest painter ever. ever. I, I had this way with a big paintbrush where I could get paint anywhere. And I did. And uh, I, I also didn't get hired back. Um, my boss said, like, uh, you, you can't paint, he said. <laughs> if you want to know what you should be doing, try things and mess up. Or here's another thing. God actually uses your interests. Some of you are interested in the weirdest things. And sometimes that might be a clue about how you're wired, what you might like to read about, uh, what drains you, what energizes you, what you love doing, what you hate doing. I mean, there are ways of figuring out how God made you and where you're fit. So you've got to start by asking that question. Second question, this helps people. How has your life experienced helped you? I mean, we're all products of our past. How did your family shape you? What chores did you do or not do? Or what did your parents teach you or not teach you how to do? Uh, what have you done before to help out anywhere, wh wherever you've been? Uh, if you think about that, if you're thinking about what to major in or what to do next, like that, that might actually help you uh, to know what you should do next. What did you learn from your experience? Question number three, this is a bigger one too. What are your circumstances right now? Where you are matters. I mean, sometimes you just need a job, right? <laughs> or, or you do what you got to do. Or you're trying to help out people who really need help. Uh, sometimes you've got a long-term goal with a bunch of steps. You've got open or closed door. But here's the funny thing. If, like, if you really believe God is that big, that God is big enough to control where you are right now, if that's true, then you should listen to where you are. God's providence is actually really powerful. And sometimes God has you exactly where you should be. This, this is sort of, I'll be honest, this is a weird passage. It's in 1 Corinthians, and the Apostle Paul is making a point to brand new believers. And they're all saying, look, okay, I'm a new creation. God has called me. Uh, old things have passed away. New things are here. I'm going to, and they're all like, we're going to quit our job and move. And uh, Jesus changes everything they said. And Jesus said something that, well, everyone was surprised at it. This is 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Then I'll read verse 20. The Apostle Paul says, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord, see what it says there? Has assigned to them. Which I'd raise my hand at that point and say, Wait, wait, hold. Look, really? Like where I'm at right now, God assigned me here? Like, is there, did I miss a memo or something? <laughs> and then he says, To which God has called him which is an amazing statement about God. Like Paul's telling people in Corinth, whatever you're doing right now, you might think it's serendipity or chance or you just ended up here, but, but it's where God puts you. Like, think about that. Maybe that matters. And then he says, this is my rule in all the churches. Here's a rule. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. In other words, like you, you, knew, you didn't know Jesus, Jesus found you, keep doing what you're doing, except maybe better. Like, this is extraordinary. Like, how might this change how you think about where God might have you right now? Like, if you really believe that God, you see this language, assigned you to it or called you to it, that means your, your circumstances might matter. At the very least, it might guide you into figuring out what's next. The fourth question to ask, and and we probably don't ask this enough because it's humbling. What do my wise counselors say? What do godly, mature people that you trust say about your future plans? Look, I look around a room like this, and I think a lot of you might be those wise 
counselors to other people you know who are trying to figure out how they fit in God's universe. Maybe you should say some things. Wise counselors point out the obvious about economics, about family, about providing for yourself. They're good at seeing open and closed doors. And you know, if you've lived enough life, you have a good perspective to give. If, you've, if you're in transition, be humble enough to ask wise people with experience. And if you're a wise person with experience, give wise experience and, and advice, which is why I think being in a church like this, interacting with people, living day in and day out, being in a small group, like, it's really good because a uh, wise counselor is important. Uh, so when I was in high school, I got some advice. Uh, my, um, my piano teacher, you're going to laugh at her, but she wanted me to go to Juilliard and uh, be a piano performance person and looking back at her, she was nuts. I was not that good. And one day, my dad, a wise counselor, we were walking around New York City. We are by Columbia University. And there was a street musician playing the saxophone. He had his case out. And way back then, people had cash. They, they, they had street musicians back then. Um, but he was really good. And uh, my dad goes, look at that guy. He's a really good musician. Look how good the street musician is. And then he asked me, uh, do you think you're that good? <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, and uh, I wasn't that good. <laughs> like, and, and then he goes, uh, so you're not good enough to be a street musician. Huh. That's all I said. <laughs> and uh, that, that's why I decided not, not to try and go to Juilliard, <laughs> which was a really good decision. Uh, sometimes listening to wise counselors help you avoid mistakes. Being humble enough to do that is important. Listen to people around you. Because they've seen a lot of life, and uh, they can help direct you. These are some questions, you know, we can spend more time on this, but those might help if you or someone you know is going through transition. But here's what I think God wants you to know today. God calls you. He assigns you. He gifts you to work. And God, I mean, the stories we talked about earlier, God enables you. And when you find yourself studying how to succeed at something, you are studying how God made the world, which means that what we need to do is what we all said that we do when we sang that song. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what's true. Who am I? Where do I belong? And when you're willing to listen and follow, and when you're at work, when you're in work, to look for God, no matter where you find yourself, no matter how you end up navigating all the doors you see open to yourself, at work, finding your fit in this world, if you look for God, who is big enough to equip us and use us wherever we might go, you're going to find him, and he'll help you. And you'll be able to work for his glory, for your joy, and somehow you'll make this world a better place for following our loving shepherd. So Father in heaven, can you lead us by your voice? Can you help us to follow you? When things are confusing, can you provide clarity? Can you open doors to opportunities when we look for it? God, for those of us who care about others, can you help us to offer wise, appropriate counsel um, to, to young folks and folks in transition um, and can you call and assign in ways that are clear? And can you use our work to show us more about who you are? I ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.